So we are now back in Romans, and this is Paul's letter that he wrote to the uh, believers that were in Rome. And mind you, as we read through this, just like other letters that Paul wrote, there was a heavy influence, of course, of Jews that were uh, very familiar with Jesus, who maybe were even in the crowd at times over the years of um, the ministry that Jesus had on this earth before his, his crucifixion and resurrection. And we know that the word through letters and through people who were traveling was passed on to Rome and to many other places. And so as we look through, you have to understand that when Paul's writing, being a Jew himself, and spending lots of time with Gentiles, that he writes kind of with that dual mindset, but he has to reach the Jew population, those who are Jewish, because um, they were the ones who were heavily influencing the main population, those maybe he who were Gentiles who were mixed in in that population. So his appeal is always going to be to the Jew first and then to the Gentile uh, in many of his letters, um, but yet he always expresses it in a way that the Jews can't get too haughty about it because he clearly states, guess what, I may have said that, but we're all equal in Christ. <laughs> and he always leaves them with that, which is great. So um, we know that in his first chapter, he already started talking with those who are in Rome um, that he wanted to visit, that he hopes to visit. Uh, he's in Corinth when he's writing this letter. It's around 57, 58 AD in that time frame. And he really expresses himself, as you can see in Romans 1, 1 through 4, that he's a servant of Christ Jesus, period. He doesn't say uh, anything, anything else. He's a servant, and, and that is actually doulos, which means a slave servant to Christ Jesus. He's called to be an apostle. He's set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand to his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, Jesus, who was a descendant of David. Once again, he's appealing now to the Jewish side, making sure that they understand, hey, he was the descendant of David that was prophesied according to the flesh and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so Paul, once again, has uh, made his appeal to those in Rome. So we move into now what is part two, and we're beginning in chapter two of Romans. So Paul writes, you therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on another. This isn't so much a rebuke as he's, he's laying the groundwork for talking about how they're judging one another according to the law and according to what's right and according to what's wrong. And so he says, you who pass judgment on another, for on whatever ground you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you pass judgment and you do the same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, oh man, and now he's saying that, talking to the, the flesh, the manhood, pass judgment on others, yet you do the same things, do you think that you will escape God's judgment? So once again, already the Jews were trying to sway the population and telling them you're going to have to live by the law, the old covenant. So Paul doesn't just come out and say, no, 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 you just said you live by the new covenant and that's it. He makes an argument here. He says, or do you disregard the riches of his kindness, his tolerance, and his patience, not really realizing that God's kindness is what leads you to repentance? But because of your hard and unrepentant heart, now he's addressing their true condition, their heart condition. You are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of wrath. When God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So we know that his judgment is going to be re revealed in the final judgment. And so this is what he's seeking to address. And he then goes on to say, but, um, 
God will repay each one according to his deeds. Now, this is confusing for a lot of people because they say, see, we're talking about now we do have to do the works of the law. And they think he's talking about the works of the law. But he's really talking about what we do, not according to the works of the law, but how we act. Is our act from the heart righteousness or is it flesh? And so he says to those who by perseverance in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow wickedness, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. So if they're judging someone according to something other than the truth, which is what they were doing, that's evil. So he's letting them know that. First for the Jew and then for the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First to the Jew and then to the Greek. Now you hear his appeal, trying to properly appeal to the Jew and then to the Greek. For God does not show favoritism. Now he's starting to, to really equal the playing field. He doesn't show favoritism. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. So the Gentiles are apart from the law, and the Jews are under the law. And if you feel as though you're going to be judged, well, guess what? All those apart from the law will perish apart from the law, and all those under the law will stay. So if you want to continue to remain under the law, well, you're going to be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but it is the doers of the law who will be declared righteous. Once again, now they're going to think, oh, you see, he's saying we have to do the, the traditional customs of the law, but that's not what Paul's saying at all. He said that we need to be doers of the law, not tradition and custom, but those things that were commanded. And we know that Jesus broke all those commandments down to two, to love God first and love everyone else. And now Paul is, is expressing his appeal this way. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law, but they do by nature what the law requires, meaning to love God first and then love others. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. So they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Now his point is going back to what the prophet said, Jeremiah, I will write my law on their hearts and in their minds. Their consciousness also bearing witness, and their thoughts either accusing or defending them on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Christ Jesus, and proclaimed by my gospel. So now he's coming back to the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will, and you approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? No, he's, he's going to lay it on him about you know what? You tell others what to do, but yet you don't do it yourself. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who forbid adultery, do you commit adultery? You who uh, abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles, because of you, circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. 
because they were boasting. Well, we're circumcised and the Gentiles aren't. So we're holier than them. And then the holier than them mindset came up. And Paul said, you know what? Your uncircumcision is, is your state because your circumcision is gone. Because it's not a matter of whether or not you were physically circumcised, breaking the law. If a man who is not circumcised keeps the requirements of the law, will he not is in his uncircumc uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? The one who is physically uncircumcised yet keeps the law will condemn you, who even though you have the written code in, circum uh, in circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A man is not a Jew because he is one worldly. Wow. Now he's cutting to the chase. He's saying, you know what? You call yourself a Jew, and that's okay. You want to follow law, and that's okay. But guess what? A man is not a Jew because he is one outwardly. Nor is circumcision only outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew because he is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise does not come from men, but it comes from God. What then is the advantage of being a Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Well, much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some did not have faith? Well, they lack faith, and their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Certainly not. Let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and victorious when you judge. But if our unrighteousness highlights the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unjust to inflict his wrath on us? I'm speaking in human terms. Certainly not. In that case, how could God judge the world? However, if my falsehood accentuates God's truthfulness to the increase of his glory, then why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result? In other words, they're saying you can do bad things because that proves how great God's mercy and grace is. We see that today. How many people who claim that they know Jesus, who claim to be a Christian, slander the name of the Lord because they say, well, it's okay. I'm forgiven. I'm going to heaven. It doesn't matter. I can do whatever I want. This is the same slander that Paul's talking about in his letter right here to the Romans. Let us do evil that God may result that good may result. That's what they're saying. Their condemnation is deserved. What then? Are we any better? Not at all. For we have already made the charge that Jews and Greeks alike are all under sin. You keep your law, do whatever you want, but guess what? Every single person is under sin. That is, it is written. There is no one righteous. No one. Not even one. There is no one who understands. No one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The venom of the vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery lie in their wake, and the way of peace they have not known. All there is for them is a lack of peace. Everything is turmoil. Everything is argument. Everything is judging. And then he goes on to say, there is no fear of God before their eyes. The beginning of wisdom is what? The fear, fear of, of God. God. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. But here we go. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, 
it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be justified in his sight by the work of the law. Wow, now he just really tells them plainly. You can go ahead and follow all these things, but don't judge someone else because, in essence, we've already proven we can't keep the law, and that we're under sin because of it. And there is nobody righteous, none, because the law identifies us all as sinners. But we who are in Christ, we are under grace and the mercy of God. We could read this very differently today. For there is those who are righteous, many who are in Christ, we have the righteousness of God, that we do understand the mysteries of heaven because the spirit lives within us. And we do seek God because he sought us first. We have turned to him. I mean, we could take these words and look at them. This is what Christ has done. This is not the old covenant and the law, but we live under a new covenant. Jesus promised us this new covenant that was in his blood. And he fulfilled the law and the prophets. So Paul is making his appeal saying, maybe you didn't hear that part. Maybe you don't understand. But we're all sinners under the law. So if you're going to choose to live under the law, realize you've got to keep the whole law. But then he goes on. And he says, for the law merely brings awareness of sin. That's the purpose of the law. That was the entire purpose of the law, was to make the, the awareness of sin. Why? So that we would understand that we need a Savior, and that through Christ and the shedding of his blood, and that sacrifice, that we can all be reconciled to God because we recognize our true condition. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed. This is where he starts letting them know the true gospel. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed as attested by the law and the prophets, which Jesus fulfilled. And this righteousness from God comes through faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And that believe is a very deep, Word meaning that we enslave ourselves as servants to Christ. There is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So he started with talking about the law, he started talking about why you shouldn't judge people, then he started talking about hey, you know what, you have the right to live under the law if you want to. However, that just proves that you're a sinner. But yet we have this through Jesus Christ. And now he's really hitting them with the gospel. He said that God presented him as the atoning sacrifice to faith in his blood in order to do what? To demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, that means of his foreknowledge, he already knew he was prepared to bear. He had passed over the sins committed beforehand. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness the present time. Now, he's letting them know that's why he did it. So as to be just and to justify the one who has faith in Jesus. Now, if you say you want to live under the law, then do so. Go ahead. Go for it. And unless you have faith in Jesus, you will not be justified because no one is justified under the law. Where then is boasting? Now he takes it away from them. No more boasting. No more proud talk. No more judging the Gentiles because they're not circumcised, because they don't do this ritual and they don't do that tradition. It is excluded. On what principle? On that of works. No, not on that of works, but on that of faith. Your works won't get you there. 
You can't follow your commandments and your traditions and your rituals and think that will get you anywhere because all that did was reveal that you're a sinner. No, but it's on faith and faith in Jesus alone. So we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Now, he's not talking about the deeds or the works that James was talking about, where the Holy Spirit uses us to fulfill God's work from his kingdom and for his kingdom. Talking about the works of the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. He just neutralizes and then equalizes the entire population that will hear this letter. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Certainly not. Instead, we uphold the law, meaning we know that the law told us that we were sinners, and now through our faith in Christ, we are reconciled to God. This is what Paul was telling those who were reading this letter. And he knew that this letter would be read not just by those in Rome, but by many others. So he appeals first to the Jew, and then he appeals to the Gentile, and then he equates them, and he tells them the truth. The gospel, that it's not by the law that you'll ever get to heaven, not by holding on to your traditions and following those precepts, because Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets, but it's through the new covenant faith in Jesus Christ because of the shedding of his blood that we have an opportunity to have life in Christ. And that was part two of Paul's letter to the Romans.